Watcher 23 introduces some major additions to the filter in the Watcher audio engine. In this video, we'll take a look at these and, if you're new to synthesis, maybe have a bit of a recap on filter terminology. As usual, timings are listed in the notes, so feel free to jump around to find the bits you need. So, let's begin. From version 23, there are now two new filter models available to play with, as well as the original one, which is now renamed as the Legacy Filter. The two new models are of a two-pole, state-variable filter, reminiscent of some classic 80s polysynths, and a four-pole, resonant, low-pass filter, inspired by even older but iconic synths of the 70s. Before we start to look at them and hear what they can do, let's just do a little recap on filter terminology in case you're coming new to the topic. Broadly speaking, there are four principal aspects to audio filter architecture. Firstly, its function, what job is it supposed to do? Secondly, its cutoff frequency, when does it start to do what it's supposed to do? Thirdly, its resonance, how much emphasis there is around its cutoff frequency? And finally, its slope, how steep is its effect after the cutoff is reached. The first new model is a state variable filter, meaning that there are several variants on the same model. There is a low pass filter, which acts to reduce the frequencies that lie above the cutoff. There's a high pass filter, which reduces frequencies lying below the cutoff. There's a band pass, which reduces frequencies both above and below the cutoff. And finally, there's a notch, which does the opposite and removes frequencies around the cutoff, but leaves everything else alone. It's a two-pole filter, which is a shorthand way to describe its slope. With a two-pole, the rate at which frequencies around the cutoff are reduced is around minus 12 decibels per octave. So if you have a low-pass filter with a 400 hertz cutoff, then the frequencies at 800 hertz, which is an octave higher, will be minus 12 decibels quieter. For a four-pole filter, the reduction will be minus 24 decibels per octave, so the effect is a lot more aggressive. Resonance, which you'll sometimes see called emphasis, or even just Q, emphasises the frequencies around the filter cutoff point. It's actually a sort of selective feedback circuit. In some filters with steep slopes, the resonance can be so strong that at high values, the filter starts to self-oscillate. The two-pole model being used in Watcher isn't able to do this, but the four-pole model, if pushed, can tend to self-oscillation. Now, self-oscillation is quite a handy feature to have in a hardware analog synth because you get a free oscillator. Unfortunately, in a digital emulation, it's a lot less useful and not very controllable. The four-pole model that Watcher uses hasn't been restricted in any way, so you need to tread carefully if you plan to crank up the resonance, because depending on the material coming in, it will, at very high levels, pitch into feedback. So with the recap done, let's quickly run through the new filter types and hear how they actually sound. For the first run through, I'll just use the sample player to give me a big analog drone as a sound source and audition the filters manually. As you can see at the top of the filter unit, there are options to mix the filtered signal with the unfiltered input. I'll use these so we're hearing just the filter, i.e. it'll be 100% wet. I'll start with the four pole low pass. As you can hear, it's a bit of a brute. Moving on now to the two-pole model, this is probably my favourite of the two. 
It's rich and full, but not quite so aggressive as the fourth pole. And because there isn't the risk of self oscillation, you can push the resonance up really high for a nice, sharp, bright emphasis. through the other versions of the two-pole filter using the same source material. Here's the high pass. And here's the band pass. And this is the knot. So that's the basic sound of the new filter models on a droning wave. Let's look now at something more involved. Here I've put together a synth preset for the WAE that's inspired by classic subtractive analogue polysynths. So just to explain what you were actually looking at, over on the left I've got three tone generator units to act as standard oscillators and they feed into a mixing junction to control their individual levels. The first oscillator is pitched an octave lower than the others, so it's there to act as a kind of sub-oscillator. The mix of these three is passed through to a filter unit, and I've got some control units placed strategically below it, so that we can emulate voltage control of the filter when we want to. And finally, there is an amplifier which has a control envelope attached for overall amplitude control of the patch. I've set the oscillators up to give us some rich sawtooth waves, with some slight detuning between them to thicken their sound, and I've put a square wave on the sub bass. Let's talk now about filter control, because there are a few things sadder than an unmodulated filter. In the WAE, there are two main ways to modulate things. For a contour over time, you use a control envelope, and for cyclical control, we have a control LFO. Now I'll be looking at the LFO in a separate video because it's quite a deep module and it just got significantly deeper with this release. But for now, let's set up the filter just for envelope control, which you do by adding the envelope to the filter's controllers list. In this version of Watcher, the available range of control signals has been greatly increased to make it easier to really push these filters hard. And this little change under the hood has made a big difference to the sound of the synth and its ease of use. Most of the time you'll be wanting to modulate the cutoff frequency of the filter. The range of control on offer from the envelopes and the LFOs is fixed to the cutoff frequency, and by default that is a static value, meaning if you set the cutoff to, say, 500 Hz, then that is its starting point for the duration of the piece. The modulation from the controllers will be added to that, which is fine if the audio you're filtering isn't going to move around too much in terms of the frequencies it contains. But when you're filtering a melodic voice, then sometimes it's often better 
to have the cut-off frequency moving relative to the pitch of that voice to make for more dynamic and often more even filtering across the note range. Now the filter unit has a lot of options to help you with doing this. Firstly, if you check the track MIDI pitch box, then the pitch frequency of the incoming voice generator is added to whatever cutoff value you've set manually, along with any of the other modulation values coming in from control envelopes or LFOs. We can audition the difference between the two approaches. Here's a sequence with no frequency tracking, and here's a sequence now with the frequency tracking enabled. The other sliders in this section let you decide how the pitch tracking will be scaled. By default, its scale is centred on MIDI note 60, middle C on a piano keyboard. But if you want to track a bass voice, say, it could be better to change that to reflect better the note range of that particular voice. So you might want to drop that down to a MIDI note 36, which then re-centres the tracking to two octaves below middle C. Alternatively, you can offset the scaling by just adding a fixed frequency value to the cutoff, either in terms of octaves, semitones, or even microtones. Essentially, these options work together to let you target the filter action to the sonic areas where it'll have more, most use for you. Finally, in this section, there is a checkbox to switch the cutoff controller values to follow a logarithmic scale. Normally, controller signals from envelopes and LFOs are assumed to be linear, but the human perception of pitch and frequency is not linear at all. Switching controllers to follow a log scale makes them sound a lot more musical when modulating targets that involve pitched audio. The difference is quite marked and dramatic sometimes. The remaining sections of the filter are all concerned with legacy aspects of the original filter. The auto sweep option is retained because removing it would break legacy presets and mixes that might rely on it, but in most cases I would say direct control of the filter from an external LFO is way better and a lot more comprehensive. But finally the section part of the legacy filter has some use still. Each section corresponds to one pole of steepness from that legacy filter. So with one section, that filter is a one pole, or minus six decibels per octave, going up to three pole, which is minus 18 decibels per octave. So if you need some very gentle filtering action, or you fancy something halfway between two and four poles, it's there to be used. Don't overlook it. Before we end the video, let's just spend a little bit of time looking at some tips and tricks for more advanced use of the filter. As the WE is a modular environment, we have a lot more flexibility to play around with than you ever do with fixed architecture synths. For a start, we can combine filters in useful ways. So if you want a really deep but controlled bass sound, one approach might be to use a pair of filters in series. If you make the first filter a high pass and set its cutoff to a low frequency and boost the resonance a bit, that really reinforces and tightens the bottom end of the voice. But if you then follow that with a low pass voice to shape the mids and highs as usual, then you get a very tight, controlled, but deep bass. It's a good technique. Another thing you can do is you can set up pairs of filters in parallel. This takes a bit of thought in the WA because of its linear left to right format, but by using a couple of junctions to split the dry signal into two and then recombining it later, we can set a high pass and a low pass in parallel as I've done on this patch here, and by doing that you create an asymmetric band pass filter with individual control of the cutoff on either side of the pass meaning you can modulate the width of the bandpass.
The notch filter is often just used as a problem solver to tame a specific frequency range. And with high resonance values, you can get a very steep notch for quite surgical removal of frequencies. But if you do the opposite and make it as flat as possible, very low resonance, then things can get very interesting. When audio is passed through a filter, its phase changes. What that means is the way the waveforms rise and fall after filtering is altered different to the dry signal. So if we take our broad notch filter and modulate the cutoff with a slow LFO and then mix that wet signal back with the dry signal, the shifting phase differences between the two signals will cause both cancellations and reinforcement in the spectral content of the audio. So our notch filter in this state becomes a rather gentle phaser. And we can make it even stronger by putting two or more of them in parallel. So there are just a couple of thoughts about creative use of filtering. But I'm scratching the surface here, really. These new filter models, especially when combined with a sample player, have really changed the depth and the range of sound that the watcher synth is capable of. And this video is probably long enough already, frankly. So now, it's time to get off YouTube and go make some music.